From Square Two, this is What's Wrong With Revenue. I'm Mike Lieberman, CEO at Square Two, and along with my longtime friend, Eric Kalis, and co-founder at Square Two and six-time entrepreneur, Eric and I will answer the question CEOs have every single day, what's wrong with revenue? You can be part of the live cast show where we'll answer your questions every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern, or catch the show on demand on YouTube and on all your favorite podcast networks. Also check out all our audio and video content on Square2 Plus at the square2marketing.com website. Enjoy the show. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 30 of What's Wrong With Revenue. I'm Mike Lieberman, the CEO and Chief Revenue Scientist here at Square Two. And I have a special guest on the show today, Kristen Stricker, who's our COO and Director of Client Services. Kristen, say hi to everybody. Hello. Eric is off today and I was lucky to be able to snag Kristen. We're gonna talk about what's wrong with revenue today. You don't have the right people in the right roles. And Kristen does a lot of hiring here at Square Two. She's responsible for a big part of the team, uh, making sure the right people are in the right seat. So I thought she'd be a really good guest to have on the show today. Before we get into it, let me do a little bit of housekeeping. You've heard the story before. If you're interested in the show, you can check it out on YouTube. It's posted at the Square Two Marketing channel. You can get all of the What's Wrong With Revenue shows on YouTube, like it, subscribe to it. Check it out at the Square Two Marketing channel. You'll find it there. If you are interested in the show and other audio and video content, go over to square2marketing.com backslash square2 plus P-L-U-S and take a look at our new streaming service where we post all of our audio and video content, including these shows. This show will be there tomorrow. You can subscribe to the show and get notified when we have new shows and post new content. And if you are a fan of podcasts, you can check out the show in podcast form on any of your favorite podcast platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, and all of your favorite uh, places where you go to get your podcasts. If you want to submit questions, and we do have questions today, you can go to squaredtomarketing.com. At the bottom, there's a button for what's wrong with revenue. You can actually subscribe to the show there, and you can submit questions like the ones we'll talk about today and share with you today. Thanks everybody for joining. We have a really good topic. Sometimes people think what's wrong with revenue. They don't think about the right people in the right roles, but we find that it's a very big issue, especially when you're talking about marketing and sales execution. It has almost everything to do with putting the right people in the right seats. From a marketing perspective, this happens all the time. People are put into marketing because no one else wants to do it. No one else has the expertise. If you think about how many marketing people are also handling the admin for the company or the HR for the company, when we do public speaking and we ask everyone, well, how many people do you have in marketing? Lots of times the answer is half a person. I don't know if it's the left half or the right half or the top half or the bottom half, but sometimes they find ways to put half people in the marketing role and that's not going to get it done. You just can't do that uh, in 2022. You need professional marketers. You need technical marketers, you need strategic marketer, marketers to drive revenue. And you also need, uh, this happens in sales a lot also. So uh, when it comes to sales, almost every single sales organization has poor performers. They're in the bottom of the rankings. We ask the same question, you know, do you have 80% of your new sales coming for 20% of the reps? The answer is almost always yes. So you really ought to start considering the same question when it comes to salespeople. You need professional sales guides. You need people who understand the new buyer behavior. You need people who are willing to work differently with prospects. And if you don't have the right people in the right roles, you will not hit your revenue goals. So today, what we're going to talk about is how to get the right people in the right roles, how to evaluate your current people and make difficult decisions sometimes. How do you use scaffolding, which is kind of what we refer to as these outside resources that help support your company. They're not full-time people, but they're, they're people that are intimate with your business and they can help you put the right people in the right roles without you having to hire full-time people. We'll talk a little bit about the in-house versus outside agency when you have a lack of expertise, how that might work for you. And we'll also talk a little bit about how people grow professionally so they can move into new roles. And... Of course, we'll answer questions and wrap up 
pretty close to top of the hour. So, Kristen, I babbled on for a while here. Um, what kind of insights can you provide for us around the right people in the right roles question? Oh, of right people in the right roles. Well, I guess uh, from a very, very high level, right, when it comes to marketing and sales for that matter, uh, both are just a integrated part of your business, right? So uh, anytime you have a key component of running your business and growing your business, you should be really thinking thoughtfully about the people that are in those roles and running it. So as Mike said, we oftentimes see maybe an admin assistant being put into the marketing role because it just seemed like that would be a good place to, to put the person because they're a good cultural fit, but they have no context or history behind marketing. It's detrimental to your business. Um, Number one, so uh, uh, make sure that you are uh, evaluating people for the right skill set and, and background. Um, and I know that we'll get to this, but it is going to be a mix of, of cultural fit and having the right uh, set of skills uh, to be placed. And, yeah. and knowing, and even with marketing, there are a number of different roles and a number of very different skill sets that are needed to really run an effective marketing plan or program. Um, so being very um, thoughtful and strategic about, to your point, Mike, the scaffolding approach, where are you gonna start? What do you need full time? What's going to be uh, more fractional? Yeah, I really like your comment about the different skills required to be successful from a revenue producing marketing perspective. So maybe we could talk about that in a minute because maybe you could even outline what some of those um, different skill sets look like. Um, I mean, I know we have kind of like a strategic skill set and a technical skill set and an executional skill set, but maybe you could talk a little bit about those in detail. But I really wanted to, to, to um, circle back to a conversation we had about a, an old client of ours. Um, we were working with the chief revenue officer and he kind of abdicated the relationship with us to someone who was kind of a, a, a admin of sorts, right? I don't, I don't uh, you know, we obviously don't want to name any names, but you know, she didn't really understand a lot about what we were doing. She didn't really understand a lot about what he had asked us to do. And it really became kind of problematic. So maybe you could just dig into that specific experience a little bit and, and do some experience sharing for the audience of what happens when you put kind of the wrong person in the seat to be responsible for, for executing marketing and, and driving leads and, and sales opportunities. What, talk a little bit about that specific experience, obviously, without throwing anybody under the bus. Sure. Again, that, that's the important part of, of having somebody who knows what they're doing in marketing, right? Because then you put this person in the middle, right, between an agency that's doing your marketing or the, the main person as your main coordinator that's going to then go to the, the chief revenue officer of the, of the organization. And while the chief revenue officer is going to probably have context of marketing and sales, as well as context around the vision of the company and, and the overall goals and objectives of what they're trying to do for the company, the person then in that role needs to understand that and what's what's being accomplished and needs to understand how marketing can be an integral part and the different ways that marketing can play into that in order to have an effective relationship. Because when they don't understand that, when somebody doesn't understand that and you're trying to work with people on the marketing side, it then becomes just a go-between of uh, a very tactical conversation. Um, and, and it's Many times with your car or even with technology and marketing, you don't know what you don't know. And then you start receiving things and you start to get really stuck into the nuances of, uh, well, is the spacing off or, or what have you, which is all very important, but that tends to then start, it starts to be the focus because that's right. the thing that's tangible to that person. And it's no longer about how can we create a marketing and sales program to help you accomplish your goals and objectives, because that person in that role does not know how to connect those two dots. And, right. and it gets lost in translation. If you then remove the chief revenue officer, or you remove the people from the marketing function that are in charge of driving the company forward and in charge of that vision and setting the goals and objectives, uh, it's, it's a game of telephone. 
And the person that's in the middle is no longer effective of, of talking to them or translating what marketing is trying to accomplish. And they're not necessarily effective in translating what the business is trying to accomplish. So again, it's important that you have a coordinator, but it's important that you have strategic people at the table that are aware of what's, what's going on as well. Right. Lots of times in our situation, we're making recommendations to clients and we're kind of guiding them or attempting to guide them, but we still need them to say, yes, we agree, do A. And if the person we're working with isn't either capable or hasn't been empowered to give us that direction, you get a very inefficient engagement. And then that typically means it's taking us longer to drive results. It means you know, people start to get frustrated with the progress that's being made. There's a lot of things like to your point, which I think is a really good one, that people tend to focus on the things that they do understand, which might not be the most important things, right? Like this color's off a little, the spacing's off a little, like, okay, but that's not going to mean whether you get 100 leads or 10 leads, right? We need you to approve this so we can turn it on and start generating some leads. We don't need to go back and forth in terms of whether the color's off by a couple pixels or the spacing is off a little bit, right? We really need you to look at this and be like, yes, this is good. Turn it on, okay? And if you can't make that decision, then someone needs to be in the right seat who can make that decision to move the program forward. So I think that's really good, uh, really good feedback. Uh, and a really interesting story that I think people can can maybe relate to. Uh, uh, on a on a slightly different but similar example, what about when the leadership has kind of empowered us? Like I know in one of our engagements, we're the fractional CMO for a software company. Uh, that's executing a little differently. Can you kind of talk about that scenario a little bit and how? how the efficiencies in that, the way that company's leadership is working with us versus maybe the way this other company is working with us? Sure. So um, in this uh, scenario, uh, we have the leadership of the company in uh, direct contact as our kind of go, go between our day to day, right? So and they're we are, highly engaged as they opposed are highly, to the, right. Yes, they're highly engaged. And that does not mean that they're having to necessarily approve every single item or what have you, but they're highly engaged in making sure that we are collectively creating a program that is going to serve their growth needs. And to be clear, it is, it is working very well, but to be clear, they are, a they are a company that is in growth mode and things are changing daily and the vision continues to evolve. So it's not like it's a, yes, a solid, here's your three-year plan, let's just check, check things off and work towards it. It's not like that at all, but because they're highly engaged with us and they are giving us access to so many other people within their organization, um, their sales team, the people that are working with their different uh, partnerships, their other marketing people. Uh, we are able to get feedback. We have a feedback, feedback loop going with the sales team. We're letting them know what we're doing and we're asking them for input on the questions that they get and uh, what they, they view as pains and, and, and what they see as needed throughout the sales process so that we can make sure that we're, we're creating the right marketing content. We are also working with them. So again, they have a vision they're growing, their vision is evolving. And that means high level messaging and things that we're doing in a very visible way is changing in a way that the sales team actually may not be comfortable with. And that it may, everybody may have to take a bit, but they're involving us and we are involved in those conversations and everybody's been engaged and whether or not they're fully comfortable or necessarily fully on board quite yet, they're part of the conversation and the leadership team is backing that. And the leadership team is backing. We are we are going with this high level message because of X, um, and and that's the way uh, it should be, right? It should be everybody's connected to the same vision and what we're trying to accomplish. Again, marketing is not meant just to drive leads. Marketing is an integral part of your business, and it's meant to drive growth. And to do that, it touches so many different facets of your organization. That's a very good point. Uh, a very good point. Okay, so. Let's go back to what we talked about a second ago. So you're the new CMO at a company. You need to build your team, right? What kind of skill sets are you looking for to execute the kind of marketing that's going to drive growth? And then when you're done, I'll talk a little bit about sales because I think there's a similar conversation around the sales side of the business, but you handle the marketing piece and I'll handle the sales piece. All right. Marketing piece. Uh, 
base level, right? Um, understanding experience of marketing, understanding of how you get to create um, foundational building blocks of marketing, right? And what marketing is meant to do. So um, how you would approach persona development, how you would- right, But who, what, who is that though, right? Like what, what role would that be? Like what, like you're kind of describing the job function, but I'm asking kind of like, what role would that be in your new marketing department? And what kind of uh, capabilities would that person need to bring to the table to handle just that? Because you're probably gonna have three or four roles, I'm guessing, right? So right. Like, you, know, you have quite a few roles, but let's just right. start with your with your main marketing um, director, right? Okay. Or director of marketing. Okay. Yes. Marketing manager, whatever level. Sure. Uh, so they have to have a comprehensive view. They have to understand marketing strategy. They have to understand how marketing strategy connects to sales, how marketing strategy connects to the business. They have to understand how to um, make connections and have conversations so that the conversation is it, basically developing relationships within the organization. If you don't have those relationships within your organization, marketing is not going to be effective. Uh, it has to be an ongoing conversation. So skilled in um, influencing others in terms of um, I've heard this and this is what I'm recommending because of the X. They have to be skilled in making sure that they're understanding and how to connect the dots in, in again, overall goals and objectives and marketing strategies and tactics that will help them iterate. They also have to really understand um, how to prioritize, right? There, is, there are a million things out there today that we could be doing for marketing um, and it's just not feasible for any organization to do them all at once. Right, right. So a really solid understanding of you have your long-term, you have your short-term wins, your quick wins, if you will, your long-term things that are going to build over time. Um, and then again, understanding, okay, where do I need to start and what long-term things should I start on and what, what short-term? And again, that's experience in, in marketing and knowing um, what do you have to have as a foundation to make sure that your quick wins can happen, right? Mm -hmm. And that then that you push those quick wins in out, that that those are something that's going to start to drive uh, momentum for the organization. So that sounds like a strategic position. What else? What else are we going to need? Yep. Uh, then you need a more uh, tactical position, if you will, and you need somebody who's really uh, a strong coordinator or project manager. Um, today in marketing, there are hundred different things that uh, the types of work that we do, there are a lot of moving parts and pieces. And if you don't have somebody who is highly organized and knows how to keep a variety of different team members on the same page, uh, things are going to get messy. Things are not going to get done at the quality level that you want them to get done. And they're not going to get done on the timelines that you were hoping they were going to get done. Okay. So what to. else? Yes. Okay. So you All need right. a strategy person, you need someone to handle execution. What else do you need? All right. I would say at a core, you need those within your organization. And now we're talking about, okay, how much work do you have? How much are you going to be investing? And now we're talking about either uh, your scaffolding approach or full-time team members. And you need- Well, I mean, regardless of whether you're hiring outside or hi like the roles are the same, right? You may, yep. you may have an agency fill the role, but still it's, it's a checkbox that you have to make sure that area is covered. Yep. You need a you need a strong writer, right? So somebody who's going to um, ideally know how to develop strong brand messaging um, and know how to create a campaign direction and know how to filter that messaging down into all of the tactical elements. And that who is then a strong, concise writer, um, if you're business to business, knows how to write in a B2B style um, and who gets your business. Uh, you're going to then need somebody who's um, analytical. Um, and that analytical person, again, like this is where it gets a little bit muddy. It's not clean cut, but one, you have the SEO side of your business, right? And you need to be looking at analytics and making sure that your on-site SEO and the things that you're pushing out there is feeding the people that are coming uh, to you, to your landing page, your assets, to your website and, and converting. So uh, analyzing the website, also analyzing uh, what you have going on within your marketing automation and uh, bringing forth insights there. Uh, and that could be a part of the main strategy role we already discussed. If that person is really strong in that way, it could be a completely separate person if, too, if you're going to have somebody that's going to be 
um, implementing on an ongoing basis too. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you're going to need you have your developer, right? Your developer needs your website should never be just be sitting there. Your website needs constant attention and constant development. You need somebody who can develop on the platform that you're on um, and, and do it well, because if you have messy website coding, if you're not doing it well, you will get pinged by, by Google. You will not be ranked. Um, it will be more of a detriment to what you're trying to do than a benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the, the whole technical side. So the marketing automation technology connecting that you'll talk about the CRM and the sales side, but you, you have to make sure your technology is integrated and um, that technical person needs to, again, understand your business and what you're trying to accomplish with your business. And they need to know how to make sure your technology will work for you. And um, that's no longer back in you know, when Salesforce came on and, and, and maybe Marketo, it was always more of a technical uh, person platform, right, in, in order to set it up. But HubSpot wasn't started that way. HubSpot was started as a user centric one. But these days, HubSpot has grown in a good way so uh, greatly and expanded how much you can do on that platform. You really do need somebody very technical in there to make sure that they are creating the system that's going to work for your business. Yeah, that's good advice. And you could potentially have a, we, we sometimes refer to them as marketing operations person that understands the technology, you know, can, can help out with the analytics. They understand the data, you know, maybe they have some light, dev capabilities because if they're you know able to do some complex things in hubspot they might have some light development skills maybe they could do some stuff on your website and with the tools today uh while there are definitely more complex development tasks that come up i think a lot of the website related tasks can be done with someone who has a very light set of developer skills so you know, maybe that mop marketing operations person can check a couple boxes, but you definitely need those boxes checked for sure. So that was really good insight into what the marketing department roles and responsibilities might look like. If you want to let now shift gears to the sales side, you, you know, uh, sales is interesting. People have always kind of looked for salespeople that have that, like, uh, you know, what is it uh d personality on uh on um what's that system this Dis, profile. profile right so the d people and and kristen we've we've kind of used the the bird metaphor at square two so those are the eagles right so sales is always looking for these and parrots right e eagles and parrots to be in the sales organization and i think that probably served people well um for a while but today, if you look at really like the best salespeople, they're the, the, they have the best communication skills. They're not always the most outgoing. They ask the best questions, which is part of the OWL profile or the I profile in DISC. And um, they're sensitive to the prospect's experience to the point where they're trying to guide them more than you know influence them or convince them to do something or buy something. So you know, it's kind of a, I would suggest it's a slightly different profile in terms of who you're looking for from a sales perspective. Uh, and whether they're, you know, an NBR and they're looking for new business to, to turn those opportunities over to someone to close them, or you have a, you know, a, a single sales uh, uh, configuration where those people are hunting and, and nurturing at the same time. I don't think it really matters. I think generally what you want to consider are people who are good at asking questions and are really good listeners and understand your sales process. They understand the experience you are trying to create for the prospects when sales picks them up and can very effectively execute that, um, that process. Now, you know, to follow on, on some of the things that Kristen said, that means they have to have a little bit of a technical acumen because there's gonna be technology involved. They have to be able to interact with the CRM. Uh, they have to be able to use the tools in the CRM to, to help them execute in an efficient way. So they can handle more opportunities than maybe they typically had in the past. Uh, you know, with COVID, sales reps are not spending as much time traveling. So, you know, they can handle more opportunities if there's technology that helps them execute a video conversation and send content to prospects and remind them with, with task notifications. All those embedded tools in the CRM make, make a sales rep's uh, execution much more efficient. So you know, you're looking for someone who's technically proficient uh, is going to follow directions, is going to follow your sales process, 
um, and then is going to really be good at asking questions and listening and, and providing good guidance to prospects. I think today the, the salespeople that do the best job guiding are generally the ones that earn the trust of their prospects. You know, they become more of an advisory, uh, they, they function in more of an advisory role than a sales role. And the prospects tend to really lean into them and trust them. And obviously trust is something that we're going for from a sales perspective. So that's kind of the core sales team. And then I think you're going to need, just like Kristen talked about this marketing operations person, I think you're going to need a sales operations person. You're going to need someone that is intimate with the CRM, who can go in and make changes to it, who can you know, take a look at feedback from the sales organization and adjust maybe the automation or adjust some of the campaigns that may be providing support for sales reps uh, from a nurture perspective, uh, who can go in and look at different dashboards and reports and and provide the sales leadership with the information they need to make good decisions, who can not only look at the data, but provide insights. You know, here's what I'm seeing. You know, this is what this is telling me, and this is what we should consider doing. I think that's a very valuable asset to a sales organization to have somebody who can go to leadership and say, hey, this piece isn't working right. Here's what we should do about it. And then let sales leadership decide what the right course of action is, and then support it from a leadership perspective. There's a tremendous amount of iteration that should be going on in your sales process driven by data. I don't think sales leadership always has the skills or the time to dig into that. I think having the sales operations role allows someone to come to sales leadership and present options and then let the leadership kind of review the options, say, this seems to make the best sense for us. This is what we're going to do. Go implement it. Let's see how we're doing. Let's meet again in 30 days and see if it's delivered the kind of uh, lift we were looking for. That, that process and those conversations, I think, are missing in a lot of sales organizations and desperately needed in 2022. So that might be a slightly different role, probably not for a salesperson, I wouldn't think, but it's possible that you might have a salesperson that's very technically oriented, very into the numbers, very into data. Uh, very interested in spending the time kind of looking at, at, at the intricacies of the sales process and trying to evaluate what's working and what's not working. It's possible you might find a salesperson that could do that. I think it's more likely that maybe you bring someone over for marketing who can do that or hire someone who's done that before. Uh, either way, I think that's a, a, a new role that you probably need. Some of our clients are, are actually have this revenue operations role where they've combined the marketing operations and the sales operations. Maybe it's one role, maybe it's two roles, maybe it's a team of people, depending on the size of your organization, the size of your marketing department, the size of your sales organization. You know, all of the, the number of people in these seats has a lot to do with how big your company is and how much you have going on at the same time. You may not be able to staff it with a single person. You may need a couple of people to, you know, take a look at, at data across a wider, or, you know, you may have multiple pipelines, you may have multiple divisions, you may have multiple sales organizations. So, you know, depending on the complexity, you might need more people than just one or two people like we're talking about here. Um, but from that, I think you can kind of um, figure out that configuration accordingly. And, you know, again, you know, to Kristen's point, you don't necessarily have to hire in house to satisfy the, these open seats. In some cases, it might be better to team up with a partner who can deliver this kind of support almost instantly. You know, today it's extremely hard to hire people like this. Almost every single agency over almost every single company are looking for people with the kind of skills and experiences that Kristen and I are talking about today. And it's difficult to find these people and it, and they are more expensive. Um, you know, we were, we are currently working with a prospect who is looking for one of these kind of marketing operations role, they were expecting to pay 70 and they're finding out that these people really demand more like a hundred. So that's simply supply and demand. These people can really write their own tickets. They can go to any agency. They can go to any in-house job and, and, get, and get roles like this. So obviously the compensation is going to be higher to pull these people out of existing jobs or to recruit them just to come and work for you. So um, that's how important these jobs are that, that these individuals with these skills are so widely sought after and people are really, really willing to overpay them. Um, in some cases, they're getting raises of 30 or $40,000 a year to move from one position to the other, because it is so hard to find people like this. So, you know, if you are going down this path of trying to hire and you're having challenges, 
there are ways to get this skill set and expertise into your company by partnering up with, with you know, uh, a firm or a company or an agency similar to Square Two. There's lots of good options out there, um, but uh, you know, it might be something you weren't thinking about that you might want to consider. Kristen, anything you want to add? No, I mean, just to tie it together too, I mean, just with that person and again, making sure the technology works for you and what you were saying about the sales team. Sales team yeah, may, typically is not going to be the necessarily the analytical people, but there's a mix of process driven, right, to make sure that they're, they're following a process. Um, and and charisma in, in terms of me being able to develop relationships and offer strategic insights, but you have to have that objective view of the data and the technology to say, okay, look, guys, this is working and this is not, and this is how we need to change the process. Because so it's then a combination of people changing the way that they're going through the sales process, as well as then again making sure the technology is working for you and changing as you go. So it should be a constant thing of, of evolution and tweaks. Yeah, agreed. Okay, let's answer a couple questions because we have some good ones here. So this is from Don in California. How do I assess if I have the right people on my marketing team? What should, what should I be expecting from them? So you have a lot of marketing people that work for you. How do you go about assessing them to make sure they have the right marketing related skills to do some of the things we've been talking about? Um, okay. So again, the types of questions or the types of conversations that you're having with them, right? So the conversations you should be having on a regular rhythm should be productive in that you're constantly connecting on what's going on with the business and what marketing is doing and their ability to connect what they're doing to the goals and objectives of the business. Uh, their ability to say, we are doing this because it is going to drive this. So that, that, that's kind of high level number one. Are, are, they, are they making the right decisions? Are they strategic? Do they know how to do the right things to get your business to where you wanna be? Um, number two, uh, again, it, is it organized in a way that it is very clear and concise that you have agreement, almost like an, an SLA, right? Agreement between everybody on what is success, what, it, what defines success? 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. The timelines might be different based on your organization and how fast you're evolving or growing or, or what have you, but you should always have agreement there on, on what you're trying to accomplish. And then are, 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 things, are things producing, right? So uh, what is the level of, uh, of work, the quality of work that's being then put out? Is it aligned? Is it your voice? Is it your business's voice? Is it being executed um, flawlessly? Is it being executed in a way that really accurately represents your business in a way that is connecting with your, pro your target prospects? Um, so anybody you have and is a core function in your marketing team should be able to connect with you in, in those ways and be able to I guide think. that work. That's good. That's good direction. And I know you have a lot of practical experience with marketing people and getting them to perform. I think the only, th only other thing I would add to that, uh, Don, is I think it is uh, if you can find somebody who is able to look at the data and quickly uncover insights and use those insights to drive recommendations, you have a really good asset on your team. I think that is a a difficult skill set to nurture, and it's a difficult skill set to find. There's a lot of people that have opinions about what they should be doing. There's a lot of people who you know want to run the same playbook at Company B that they ran at Company A. There's a lot of people who you know uh, you know know how to execute an email marketing campaign or, or, or know what pages on a website ought to be there. Um, but there are very few people who can look at that website and say, "Hey, these pages are not performing, and here's why." And here's what I want to do about it. So if you can find people like that, and, and we try to do, we try to uncover some of that when we interview here at Square Two by giving people like a project and talking about very specific situations and seeing how they respond to those, those use cases. Uh, if you can find people that are capable of that, I would snatch them up immediately because those are, like I said, you, they're really more learned experiences than taught. You have to have a lot of experience looking at data and looking at program performance to start to know what to look for and, and be able to interpret it and then turn that 
insight into recommendations. That I think is huge. So that is certainly one of the things I would be looking for if I was putting a marketing team together today. And honestly, regardless of what role they're in, and like Kristen outlined a lot of the different roles, I think if I could get that skill set in as many people as possible, regardless of role, you're going to do a lot better from a, a performance perspective. So that's what I'd be looking for. All right, Kristen, this is from Mark in New York City, and uh, we can talk a little bit about this together. What is the balance between cultural fit and capabilities fit? Which is more important? What do you do if there's not a fit on either side? So let me just lean into the cultural piece because that's pretty important to us. Um, I don't know how important it is to a lot of companies. So I think from my perspective, these are both equally important. We typically refer to them as attitude and aptitude here at Square Two. And we, we generally try to review people's performance on both matrices, on, on both, what is it? Matrix, matrices, whatever, right? Both, both lines, we're trying to evaluate people's performance from attitude and aptitude perspective. The attitude is all about culture. Like, are they a good cultural fit? Do you have core values? Do you have cultural imperatives? Can you literally look at those things and say, this person is behaving in a way that isn't aligned with the way we, we want people to behave at the company? It should be pretty black and white. You know, uh, at, at Square Two, you know, uh, every client is a raving fan is one of our core values. If we have people who are not leaning into taking care of the clients, no matter what that means, then they're not necessarily a cultural fit. It, you know, we have... Um, uh, no fluff is one of our core values. If people are skittish to provide feedback in a direct way uh, or uncomfortable when people give them feedback in a direct way, they're not going to be a great cultural fit. And I think that's equally important if you want them to be successful. Uh, on the capability side, it's the same thing. They have to be able to do their job. And I think both of these are equally important. I do think that if you have someone who's a cultural fit, and they're a little weak on the capability side, there's an opportunity to train them up you know, if you think that's worth it. Generally, in my experience though, if they're not a cultural fit, you can't train them. They're either gonna be a cultural fit or they're not. And if you made a mistake and hired someone who's not a cultural fit, you're probably better off letting them go and looking for someone that is a cultural fit to try to turn someone around in terms of the way they behave and the way they talk and the way they act. Anything you want to add to that, Kristen? Yeah, just to back that, um, you know, there have been times where we've had highly intelligent people that are very skilled, very smart, but have been a horrible cultural fit. I will say those are some of the most dangerous people for an organization. They can be a cultural cancer. They can cause a lot more disruption than you may ever think uh, with, the, with the people within your organization. And, and those are probably the ones you, you need to move fast on. Yeah, that's a really good point. I remember we had someone at Square Two who was very smart and very good at what they did, but their MO was to start fires so they could put them out. So, you know, again, that was very disruptive to the entire organization to have to respond to those fire drills like that. And those fire drills were unnecessary. So again, bad cultural fit, even though they had the capabilities to do the job, just not worth trying to get them to change the way they work. That probably wasn't going to happen. All right. This is from Lindsay in New Jersey. Can you talk to the different experiences with hiring younger people and training them up versus hiring more experienced people and paying them more? So this is right up your alley. What, what do you think about this question? Um, that's always a delicate balance. I think that there is definitely, um, value to hiring on the younger side and training them up, right? They're, you're training them up in a way that you want, um, to see things work within your organization and, um, uh, usually have somebody who's hungry to learn, right. And, and willing to really dig in and, and try different things, um, just the one caution there is make sure that you have some key senior people that have diverse experience. If you don't have that within your organization, you are missing out. Um, I mean, one of the, the advantages of working with an agency is agency people have a lot of experience. They've worked with hundreds of clients. There's a lot of expertise there and there are specialties, right? So you need that, that those senior people with, with the context and with the experience and the, the many different experiences to be able to assess and evaluate a situation or a problem or a challenge or strategy uh, to be able to, to, 
to guide the team to make the right steps. Now, that's where I think if you have that person settled and strong and uh, in place, then I think you can definitely bring on more junior team members as long as they have the right leadership to give them um, guidance on what they're doing. Right. Very good. Um, I also think you need to be, it's more of a strategic conversation, honestly, because if you're going to be hiring younger people, I think you need to be prepared for that group to cycle through more frequently. Uh, mm -hmm. So our experience has been, you know, you can have younger people that are a little less expensive. You can train them up, but be prepared for them to leave in a couple of years. So that means you have to constantly be cycling people through the organization. You have to constantly be looking for them. You have to constantly be nurturing those relationships. When someone leaves, you have to be able to reach out and, and, and fill that seat and get them trained. Your onboarding and your training needs to be very, be very efficient. It needs to be very effective in getting them trained up quickly. Um, it probably needs to be ongoing. So you need to invest a certain amount of time every single month and in, in, in continue, continually training them. And then you can't be frustrated in two and a half years when they say, hey, I'm moving on to a you know, better job that's going to pay me more, because that's, I think, something that is more than likely going to happen in those scenarios, as opposed to bringing on more senior people who may have had a bunch of jobs already. They're not looking to necessarily hop around. They're looking for stability because of their position in life. They're looking for good work-life balance. Money isn't necessarily everything to them. They're looking for good leadership and good managers and a good professional experience. And they may be willing to stay longer because of the value in those other uh, parts of their experience versus just compensation and title and an and area of responsibility. So it, 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 to me, it's a very strategic conversation in terms of which way you're going. Um, and I think a lot of the companies that are suffering today with a lot of the resignations, unfortunately, chose the younger path. And they're, they're, we've heard from a lot of prospects and, and clients that we're talking to about how their agencies have had a lot of turnover. Their agencies have lost a lot of people. We were just on a call today with a new client who was very disappointed that he had three account managers in some short period of time at his other agency. So, you know, I think that's something you need to be prepared for if that's a, uh, an approach you're going to take. And if that kind of turnover is challenging to you and your business, then I would consider a different, a different approach that might include more senior people. Uh, it just uh, one thing to add, sometimes too, we see people, to your point, Mike, where they place more junior level people within the marketing function without really direct marketing senior leadership. Mm -hmm. And again, that's at a detriment to your business. Uh, the On the more entry level side of things, they don't understand how marketing truly should connect to the business. Yep. And so you're not only cycling, you're you're missing out on on making marketing a truly powerful thing for your business. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of people also feel like hiring in-house versus using an agency is safer, right? I'm going to own the knowledge. I'm going to own the expertise. You know, we're going to keep everything in-house. And I think they tend to either ignore the potential risk associated with these people leaving, right? And all of that, it has a name. Institutional knowledge goes right out the door with that, right? Right as opposed to working with an agency that has multiple people working on their account, multiple people with institutional knowledge. Even if one person leaves, there's three other people that know this account really well who can, you know, onboard someone new and not miss a beat. So, you know, I think people sometimes misunderstand the risks associated with in-house versus using an agency like us to solve some of their marketing related needs. They're just different risks. There's not one is more risky than the other you know, it's just, you know, understanding the risk and rewards associated with both options. Okay. Um, we're really doing well here on time, but I do have a couple other questions I want to get to. Um, this is a good one. Uh, and it's kind of related to what we were talking about. So this is from John in uh, Seattle. What about moving? So we talked about like the initial decision, hiring in-house versus hiring agency. But John's question is about moving from internal resources to external resources. What's the major difference, positive and negative, if they have an internal team and they've decided to move to an external team like us? So how would you coach someone else, uh, someone up to kind of manage that, that move from having that 
couple of internal people to maybe having an agency support them? Um, uh, a lot goes into that, but uh, I guess number one, assess like what are your needs as an organization in terms of how much of a marketing lift do you need? Um, how effective has your marketing been to date? Um, and do you feel that, again, you have a team that has the mix of the right cultural um, cultural value set to cultural fit as well as then um, areas of expertise? And do you have the right leadership on your, in your organization to guide that team effectively? Uh, if not, um, then you could have a combination of a couple things, right? If not, you might want to move away from some in-house people. You might want to. You, you do need to have a couple core people within marketing, right? Whether you're working with an agency or not. Um, and then, if you want to partner with an agency, big again, a big advantage of working with an agency, they have uh, people that have very specific areas of expertise. You're getting the best of the best. You have areas within their areas of ex you have people within their areas of expertise who have seen many different situations within marketing and can, can give you really best in class advice um, that this is what they do for a living. Um, but you can also continue to work with your team, your in-house team. If you do think your team has the right skill set, they're the right cultural fit, and you think they could be effective, there are ways to collaborate with an agency as well to give your marketing an extra boost to make sure your team is focused on the right things and that you bring in an agency. And you, you, best advice though, is to make sure you're connecting on a strategic level and you're not just using an agency as a vendor and telling them just create this one thing. Um, agencies, again, you have areas of expertise. They can give you the best advice when you let them in the door of strategy. And they can really think about what you're trying to solve for and give you recommendations and thoughts on how to get there. Um, and you can have a very powerful combination by combining your in-house team with your agency. That's a good point. And one of our questions here is, does your company offer any training for clients? This is from Andy in uh, Miami. Um, look, yes, we do. But instead of answering the question like directly like that, I think, you know, it is important to find a partner that that looks at education and training in a productive way. Right. We're not uh, in our case, we don't try to hold everything behind a wall because you might learn how to do it and then you don't need us. That, that's not our approach to working with our clients. And I don't think it's many agencies. I think you, know, you want to look for a partner that is going to train you and is going to share expertise and give you tools and you know, teach you to fish as best as, as you possibly can or as much as you want to, right? Some clients want to learn how to fish. Other clients, honestly, they just want us to fish for them. And as long as we kind of understand that up front, that's fine. But you know, if you are interested in learning some of the things that we do, then you, we're happy to do it. And you should, you should have an agency that is happy to do it also. So yes, we provide formal training in a lot of different areas, but we're also very, very comfortable, you know, telling you what we're doing and showing you why we're doing it. And even giving you some of the tools that we use behind the scenes so that you could potentially do this down the road on your own. And I think that, you know, if that is important to you, Andy, then you just want to make sure you have those conversations with the people you're vetting up front and make sure that you're on the same page in terms of how they're going to work with you. There are probably some people that don't want to do that, but I think these days, for the most part, that's pretty common uh, with agency partners. All right, Kristen, I have one more question and then we'll wrap up for the day. And this is a good one because, you know, speed and timing is always something that we talk about. How long would you expect a new, this is from, sorry, this is from Sarah in uh, South Carolina. How long would you expect a new team member to be with the team before they're fully onboarded and productive? So again, you know, we hire a lot of people, we bring them on, we onboard them. So from your perspective, how long should Sarah really be expecting some of her new marketing team members to be in that onboarding stage before they're kind of capable of flying on their own a bit? I mean, our rule of thumb, like, fully onboarded, finding their way around six months. Um, are they going, not going to be effective before that or producing something? No, that doesn't mean that at all. Um, I think that within two weeks, you can have somebody with their feet on the ground and starting to really glom onto tasks and, and, and such. But 
to really, again, cultural, develop the relationships, get to know the organization, get to know the ins and outs and nuances of your company, uh, get to know the, the contextual history of what has been done before and get the way in which you run processes and, and, and all of those different things, you really need to give somebody a runway of at least six months. Mm -hmm. Why well, don't you talk a little bit about how we onboard and what our expectations are from, from people that might be useful to some of our uh, audience? Sure. Um, so from our onboarding perspective, when somebody comes on the first week, they get a mix of, of meetings, um, intro meetings. They meet with the different teams um, so that they get a nice... Uh, they get to meet everybody. Um, they get to then also from a different team perspective, understand their roles as a team within the organization and, and what they do. Um, they get to meet with Mike and, and with, with Eric. Um, and those are more cultural conversations where they're having conversations and making sure that they understand the foundation of our, our, our culture, our core values and our cultural imperatives and um, allow them to ask any questions. We set them up with a buddy a mentor. So doesn't usually somebody outside of their um, immediate uh, area of expertise, they're it's not they're their team. direct manager, it's somebody not else. their direct manager, somebody that they should feel comfortable saying, like, what the heck, why, why does square two do this in this way? This seems odd, or just 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 somebody who can be um, give them explanations, um, somebody that can kind of give them context into why we do things. Um, and, uh, and then from there, it's a, a lot of also then, you know, of course, your HR onboarding, and then we start to give them baseline information on our project management system, on give them context on kind of our, our Mike loves, um, I always use this word, but our frameworks that we use for our clients and um, to start to understand how we run engagements and our, and our communication rhythms and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a lot of information in the first week, but then we make sure we double back as, you know, weeks two and three as we go, especially in the things that are overwhelming and you wouldn't know till you get into the technology, such as the project management system. Now that, that you're in there and using it, let, let's talk about it again. What are the questions you have? Um, and uh, then making sure we set up regular rhythms every week to touch base with them, make sure that they're getting what they need, questions answered. We also tend to map out some certification programs, right, that we think will be helpful for them to get, um, you know, in this case, like HubSpot certifications. If they don't already have them, these are the ones that would be most useful and helpful to have. Yeah, we also, some other things just to wrap around what Chris is saying, uh, I'm personally a pretty big fan of daily huddles for new people. Um, and the huddles are brief 50 minute check-ins just to make sure that, you know, what they did yesterday went smoothly, what they're working on today are the right things. And if they're having any issues, we can deal with them quickly. Um, I came from an organization where I was introduced to this concept of daily huddles. I was generally pretty skeptical of it. Why the heck do I need to meet with my boss every day for 15 minutes? And literally after a week or so, I was really enjoying it. And mostly because it was dedicated access. I was getting questions answered very efficiently. Um, and I was able to go about the rest of my day without needing to talk to, you know, my, my leader at the time. Um, and it worked really efficiently. So we, we try to run those here too in the beginning. Um, and, and, and then I typically just leave it up to the, the new team member. They can continue it. I'm happy to do it. We can make it a couple times a week. We can make it once a week. We can make it once a month. So I generally let the timing of that fade over time based on how they're doing and, and, and what kind of access they need. And then the last thing that I think is probably pretty important is we do 30, 60, 90 day plans for all new team members. I think it's important to, to clearly set some objectives with what do we expect from them after 30 days? And this isn't like a job description. This is like where they need to be from a developmental perspective. So, you know, if it's a consultant per se, we might say at the end of 30 days, you should be comfortable participating in a client conversation. You're not going to lead it. Um, and you might not actually be responsible for anything in that, but you should be able to hop in and participate and can, you know, uh, add value if necessary, because you may have been working on some of the things that are specific to that particular client. After 60 days, you should be uh, uh, an active participant. You should be maybe leading some of the, the things that are getting discussed. And by 90 days, you should be leading the call. You should be setting the agenda. You should be really in charge of that engagement. That gives them a very clear progression of how they need to move through their first 90 days. And we're all on the same page about what's expected of them. Honestly, we, despite my 
efforts to not throw people in the deep end here after 19 years, I think we still throw people in the deep end. So uh, after 30 days, lots of times, some people are a little bit behind. And then we have an honest conversation about what they need to do to catch up. Generally, they catch up after 60 days and by 90 days, they're really in good shape. Uh, and it's our responsibility to get them in good shape at those uh, uh, milestones also. So we're kind of working together with them to make sure they have what they need. I can really only Kristen, maybe you remember differently, but I think that in the entire time I've been doing this, I've only had one person not get out of the 90 day period. And honestly, that was a mistake from a cultural perspective. She was a creative director that I don't know what we were thinking, but anyway, uh, it was not going to work and we had to let her go after 90 days. But I don't think I can recall a single person that didn't get through their 30, 60, 90 days with us, certainly in the past you know, time you've been here. Can you? Um, maybe just one, but not, it's not, okay. not a frequent All right, one. Well, one's not bad for sure. Awesome. Okay, great. Kristen, thank you so much. I really appreciate you stepping in and helping out. Um, let me just remind everybody, uh, episode 31 next week is going to be what's wrong with revenue. You're making small changes when you should probably blow up your sales and marketing efforts. So we see that a lot. Also companies are, afraid to blow things up. They're afraid to make big, bold moves. So we'll talk about that next week. If you're interested in the show, go check it out on YouTube at the Square Two Marketing channel. Subscribe, like us. Uh, all of our episodes are posted on our channel there. If you want to check out the show and our other audio and video content, you can go to square2marketing.com backslash square2 plus, where we have a totally free streaming service. And we are posting new uh, video and audio content to that platform on a weekly basis. Uh, you can subscribe to Square2 Plus and get notified every time something new comes out. Um, if you want to submit questions like uh, some of the people today, you can go to the What's Wrong With Revenue uh, link at the bottom of the Square2 Marketing Plus and you can uh, square2marketing.com website and you can submit questions and we will handle them on the show like we do every week. And if you're into podcasts, check us out on all, the, all your favorite podcast platforms. Like us, subscribe, comment really into feedback from the audience who is listening to this. And thank you so much for joining us, Kristen. Thanks again for helping us answer the question, what's wrong with revenue? And we'll see all you guys next week. Thanks again. Thanks.